Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. This is Film Talk Weekly. I'm Castle Searcy with the Santa Fe International Film Festival. I'm your guest host. Today we're here with Tammy Botkin. She's sitting in a car in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Tammy, are you there? I am here, hello. And you have a director's hat on. You look like you're on your way somewhere. Yes. This is my mobile office. Um, and yeah, my my schedule shifted around today. Um, I wasn't sure if I was gonna have time to do this and make it to my next destination. And I certainly didn't have time to do my hair. So the right. hat. <laughs> yes. Well, and your what is your next destination? Um, I am meeting with another producer about a new project. Okay, so the director hat makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, and it's great. I mean, it's uh, it's it's a good way to cover the fact that I didn't get up early enough. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Well, you look like a hustler. I think. That's busy. Um. So, why don't you tell us about you? You're a filmmaker. What and a director. What other titles do you carry? Um. Uh, well, I I do producing, directing, and writing. Um. But this is, I don't know, probably my 27th career. Um, I, I started uh, working in the film industry in 2014. Um, I actually started out by catering some sets for my husband, um, who I just married. And uh, he'd been in the business um, his whole life. So, uh, but I, I just looked around and I was like, hey, this is this is just like project management. I can I can do that. Um, so I started producing. Um, but right before then, I had had a career in um, the public housing sector, uh, homelessness prevention, and then before that, I had been uh, um, in the financial sector around housing finance. Okay, that sounds like good work to do. Um, and so you just got into this business in 2014. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So you've been at it for 10 years now. And what are you most proud of? Oh, wow. Um, what projects can we look for that? Okay. Yeah. You're... Well, in uh, April, um, I have uh, my first feature link documentary that I wrote, directed, and produced um, will be on uh, PBS member stations. Um, it's available for them to use for like the next three years for broadcast purposes. It's called A Long March. Um, that documentary is about Filipino Americans fighting in World War II under the US flag. Then after the war, Congress de declared many of these troops not on active duty. Um, there is a huge story of inequity and um, racism behind this. And um, so I got to work on that with uh, a local Filipino American group that kind of grew out to national coverage. And uh, it's just been an honor and a blessing. Uh, it has been a hard road, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm super proud of that work. So um, how, how do you get involved in that yeah that one was interesting um that one started with uh there were my after my aunt died in 2015 2016 um that sounds like a long death that's not nice um but after he passed away my uncle would come over for dinner quite often and he would tell me that um she left in the basement this big crate of paintings and inside of it were four world war ii paintings and um you know he would say my my lawyer thinks that i should do something with these somehow document them your mom says you're a good writer um and my attitude towards it was hey white man make war what do you want to know um and i really was flippant about it until 2018 he came over and he's like hey so um, I took these paintings to this group of Filipinos that were having this kind of ceremony thing. And I was like, what are you talking about? Um, and uh, 
he's like, hey, did you know we totally screwed the Philippines during World War II? And I had to think about it. And I'm like, I have no knowledge of World War II in the Philippines. Um, MacArthur said something once about I will return or I shall return, but I had no context for it. Um, so I started paying attention and um, met with local um, representative from the Filipino Veterans Recognition and Education Project. And from there, it just all began to unfold and we started building partnerships. But it did start with some really gruesome oil paintings. Um, the largest one is four by five feet, which are now in my possession. <laughs> Looking for a museum. In, in your apartment? No, nah, well, it's it's in a storage unit. So my apartment's not that big. <laughs> um, so in this case, the story found you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or we found each other. It's really interesting because a lot of people have said, you know, so unless those paintings showed up in your life, you would never have done this. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know how I would have known. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. Right. Um, and then, so it seems like you focus on documentaries. And, I have been. Um, and these stories I, find you and like you're open to it, you're listening, you're paying attention. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I also have uh, some narrative work that I've, you know, worked on personally. Um, my husband's a great script writer, narrative stuff. Um, it's more expensive um, a lot of times. Uh, so that's more difficult. And, you know, because of the work with A Long March, um, you know, I received an offer from a producer who's working with American Masters on a new docu series called Renegades, and so I'm working on an episode about Senator Daniel Inouye, who we actually feature in a long march because he was one of the senators of, uh, who really, really pushed for Congress to restore rights and recognition to Filipino American veterans. Um, so now I get to work on that. Um, it's actually, it's kind of wild to think that I guess by the end of this year, I'll actually have two uh, documentaries that I've done up on PBS. Wow. That's why. Cool. And we can watch yeah. them on PBS. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tammy is in Denver right now, but I know you've done some work and Al you spent some time in Albuquerque um, since this show airs in New Mexico. Um, maybe tell us about your experience working in New Mexico. Yeah, um, so originally, yes, I'm from Denver um, and uh, New Year's of 2020, we, my husband and I moved to Placidas, which is uh, between Albuquerque and Santa Fe. And we thought, you know, grass is greener in New Mexico, film incentives, you know, maybe we can get more done. Um, but of course, uh, as for many in the industry, um, March of 2020 was pretty devastating as uh, COVID came slamming in. And oh, you moved there right before the pandemic? Oh yeah, my God. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was really, really difficult. And um, at that time, my husband, Greg, was really working post-production, which isn't something that has the strongest foothold in in New Mexico quite yet. Um, and here I had this doc that, you know, we had a couple more shoots planned. That's a long march. And, um, you know, we couldn't travel for those anymore. The veterans that we were trying to get to to interview who were already so, you know, elderly and fragile were just being picked off by this virus. Uh -huh. uh, oh my gosh. Yeah, so we just, we had to pivot into post-production and figure out how we were going to make the film with what we did have. Um, but um, it was, it was difficult in that we were really quite isolated. I mean, we loved the community that we were in. Um, we were in a low density residential area. Okay, great. Um, 
Let's take a short break for these messages. This is Castle Cersei, guest ho hosting Film Talk Weekly with Tammy Botkin, director, producer, documentarian. What was the other thing? What else do you do? Writer. Well, a poly yeah, polymath. Yeah, writer. Uh, yeah, budget writer. <laughs> Word writer. What's your website, Tammy? Uh, my website is www.com. A T E R F L I X dot com. That's Otterflix. Otterflix dot com. On two acres backed up against the BLM. And so, you know, we had a lot of time to commune with uh, the enchanted state, um, but not so much people. Um, and also because I was working on a film that's really telling um, an Asian American, <clears throat> Filipino American story. Yeah, I was looking for really specific people to be working with in post-production. And that meant that a lot of the work that we did was sent out of state. Um, you know, so, because it, it really took a, quite a bit of time because we lost funding too. Um, funds that had been promised, you know, we just had um, those donors come back and say, you know, we're, we're not going to commit our funds any longer. We're but I wanted to have an orchestra. Uh, I wanted to score this entire thing with a, a Philip, the first Filipino who ever played Carnegie Hall. His name is Michael Data. We struck up a friendship over the phone and started crafting the score for the film. And, and um, we were originally thinking we were going to end up uh, recording this out in New York. Um, I'm I'm admiring your. Um perseverance through the pandemic. I mean, I think it's also like, what else are you going to do, I guess, besides edit a film, probably? Like, were, were you involved in the editing or you were overseeing? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, here's the great story. Um, my husband was my editor on this project. Um, and um, there was some screaming. <laughs> so you're already <laughs> living at home together, working from home together and now you're working on your project together yeah. yeah 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 and you know he's been in the industry his entire life i'm just you know i'm i'm new to this this is my directorial debut i make outrageous requests you know i say i understand what you're saying i understand that this is how people normally do it but i want it this way and he's like Sometimes I think it's better to come from a different industry and have like a different perspective on something like that, though. Yeah. Like, why not? Yeah. Why can't you do it that way? And maybe you can't, but, you know. Yeah. He always speechifies uh, with people that um, you, you either have opinions or instincts. Speechifies? Uh, what? Speechifies. Or, yeah, he, he also teaches, uh, um, like, he's currently teaching at university uh Colorado at Denver. We plan to interview him one day. Oh uh, yeah, he'll be fun. He he likes to teach people and he gives his little speeches and stuff. Okay. But he frequently gives this speech about um you either have opinions or instincts. And um he would usually relent and say, no, that was actually good instincts. You made a good choice there. You're still married. We are. I mean, yeah. I think it brings in, yes, tension and comedy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you got to have a pretty good sense of humor when... So, so we... this Albuquerque um, orchestra, you, the, you recorded this during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And did the orchestra have to get together or do they record separately? Yeah. I don't um... even know if that's possible, but... Yeah, so people, I'm uh, guessing other people don't know. Well, we talked about how we were going to do it. And I, there was some conversation about do we bring people in in groups um, or do we bring them in all together? And there was just enough space. Um, we actually did this in uh, over at Albuquerque Post with Michael McDade. Um, that was the facility that we used. And um, I talked um, to another filmmaker who used that facility as the uh, Janae Chase was on the show a couple weeks ago. She worked on Flame and Hot, the Cheetos uh, series, and that they used that as the Cheetos factory. So now you're using it oh. to 
film. So these are sound like it sounds like a great location in Albuquerque. It was a fantastic. Like, it's a Cheetos experience. factory. It's an orchestra. Yeah, it's, it's usually an ADR facility. Um, but yeah, there was enough space that we were able to put um, enough distance, you know, to kind of create some social distancing. Not a ton, but a little bit. Um, you know, we had our COVID protocols in place. Um, everybody signed the their uh, acknowledgement that they had taken their temperature in the morning, that they were wearing their masks. Um, and where did you find this group? Were they already working together? Were they with? That was Harry. Um, that was Harry. Uh, he found them all, or they found a group. Yeah, that he, was... he reached into Kristen Ditlow. He knew he knew a bunch, but then he reached over to Kristen Ditlow, who helped fill in the rest. Um, and then we did, of course, have Michael Dad up. He flew out um, because he's he's the conductor, composer, um, and also uh, just a masterful classical guitarist. I mean, I just, oh, I can't even say enough. And um, he also brought his wife, um, who is a, a violinist. Um, her name is Yu Cheng Ma. Um, she is a big sister to another famous Ma with a cello out there. Um, she's just a phenomenal, phenomenal woman. And, uh, they came in the night before, um, our recording session and stayed at our home and Placidus with us. And I was laying on the floor as Michael and Yu Ching were practicing their duet in my living room. And, um, I was glad cause I was kind of off to the side and nobody could really see that I was just lying on the ground with just tears rolling out because it's just such beautiful music and part of why it's so gorgeous is because not only is Michael just a brilliant composer but um he is very close to this topic he his oldest brothers served in guerrilla troops during World War II. He was one of the youngest, um, but his older brothers did serve. And so he knows the carnage, he knows the sacrifice, and that came through in the music. Um, that A lot of people think, oh, it's a movie about war. It's not. It's a movie about unrequited love, really, um, of you know, a million people who served under the American flag as with identities as Americans, who the government just is like, eh, forget it. Um, you cost too much money and you're brown. So why do we bother? Um, it's, it's just heartbreaking. Well, I admire your, any filmmaker that goes to the effort to make sure the film is authentic and um it seems like I, you, I it seems like you couldn't do it any other way you know you because those are like, someone could just buy like stock you know audio like orchestra you know these extra layers you add to it like show the love for the subjects and it sounds like that's just the way you work and can't yeah, work. definitely. I mean, when you have an, an opportunity to interview the editor of the film, Greg, um, he'll also tell you that he would get irritated with me because I'd walk up and, you know, I'd point at the archival footage and I'm like, dude, you can't use that there. And he's like, why? I'm like, that's 1944. He's like, so what? And I'm like, it's 1942. And he's like, nobody's going to know. And I'm like, somebody's gonna know somebody <laughs> know there are there's like websites dedicated to picking oh, somebody films and i noticed those little things you know and major films even yeah. either make those mistakes or take those shortcuts and i just i think it's really important especially these days with the knowledge that we have like why would you do it any other way right um, well and also i mean i'm i'm telling i i, I want to be clear like People are like, why are you telling a Filipino American story? I'm like, I'm telling a story about US history, but I feel like it's less my voice and me creating a platform for the unheard voices to come through. 
Um, and because I am not myself Filipino descent, um, it just has to be unimpeachable. Everything that I do is under such a level of scrut scrutiny as it should be, um, especially as I, I myself am calling my country into accountability for this, saying, you know, is this how we want to be? Um, so, yeah, I think the stakes are really, really high in this case. Um, and even if they weren't, I would still be this anal. <laughs> good, good. We're oh, here for yeah. And, you know, I think the great thing about film is anyone asking why you're making this film can make a film of their own. I want to talk about, first of all, let's let the audience know again on PBS, they can watch A Long March and also Renegade. Yeah, so a long march will um, be available for PBS member stations to start programming in April. Um, we're kind of hoping that uh, a few stations, like maybe KPBS out in San Diego, uh, will pick it up in time uh, to memorialize the Bataan Death March because we do talk about that quite a bit in the film. It's one of the few touchstones that if Americans really understand what happened in the Philippines, they know that one. Um, also then May for Asian American Pacific Islander Month, um, we expect to see a good uptick there. And I think that's when most people really start seeing it on their stations. Um, the website for that uh, documentary, if you want to track it, um, is www alongmarch.com um and then renegades is scheduled i believe for release in october and that's an american masters series okay that'll be out in october and along march is april yeah okay cool and you're working on other you've got other documentaries though i think I you have, yes you have something coming you're Screening something in New York. Well, okay, so a long march is actually screening uh, three nights back to back in New York um, in February. So February twenty first, we're at Fordham Law School, um, and that is all of these are open to the public. Um, and again, alongmarch dot com is where you can look for tickets. So if there's somebody listening in. New Mexico and you want to get your butt out to New York um, on the 21st. I will be or... there. I'm getting my butt out. To That's me. Right. Yes, and, you know, for a lawyer, you could get continued learning education credit for that one. Okay. Um, and then um, at, following that is a nice cocktail reception. So that'll be fun. Then on the 22nd, we're headed over to Columbia Law School and um, having another panel discussion there. Um, and then on the 23rd, we're going upstate to Hamilton College and doing another screening and Q&A. So um, that is, I would call that a trifecta for me. Um, really excited that, and those are, those are actually premieres in New York. Um, the film has not had public screenings in New York before. Now, how did you put that together? Do you have a publicist, an agent? Do you find these do they find you like for the people you've only been doing this 10 years like and not even like, this like you're yeah. inspirational to people out there who maybe you know look if you're honorary enough and you like the brain damage you can do anything um <laughs> so um we started uh educational distribution through good docs um in last january and um, in the spring, I thought, you know, after our first quarter, I was like, huh, people aren't just automatically going and picking up this film for schools. And um, so I started my own little drip outreach. I don't know. I think I started with like 20 colleges or universities. I got like responses from Harvard and Yale. Um, and um but then it was like, oh, wait, the spring is kind of difficult. Everybody's coming up on summer break. Um, how do we want to do this? So basically, I spent the summer building um, email outreach campaigns to directly go and 
promote the film to colleges and universities. So you're your own publicity. Team. I did it. I did it. <laughs> um, you know, I I had um, some help from an intern, Kobe Sober Sober Messena, who is um, out in the San Diego area. He worked with me remotely to to help manage the email campaigns. Um, so that is how we got these kinds of bookings. Um, it's such an obscure topic, uh, for so many people and, you know, because it's an independent film and you never know exactly what you're going to get. Somebody's like, oh, Hey, I made this film. And they're like, yeah, right. Who are you? Um, is it any good? Do I actually care to spend 30 seconds of my time to watch a trailer? Yeah, the trailer looks good, but what does that mean? <laughs> you know, you're just you cold, to... you're cold calling these people, and you have Pretty your packet, and you have your trailer. Oh, cool. Absolutely, and you're doing it by email. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so you know, it's like figuring out what is your message. How do you get people to click on the email? How do you get them to respond? Uh, how do you get them to book? Um, reaching out I, to people I, that it makes sense to also. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and the way that I did it, I, absolutely. They were very targeted. I started with schools that um, either had fill um coursework um, or program. What kind of, what kind of? Filipino American, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Filipino American studies. Um, and then I kind of branched out from there looking for schools that had Asian American studies. Um, and then, you know, just kind of kept branching out from there. Law schools were my third prong. Um, so, and, you know, more recently, I just started emailing out to libraries saying, hey, this is, this is available. It's very intensive work. Um, you know, and again, we have... Um, an educational distributor that does quite well with many films but this again is such a niche film people when they hear this topic they're like why should i care um why should they care why should they care and it's like well i'm asking you tammy yeah we have this identity in the united states of america as you know we're leaders in the world and um, you know, we're this great melting pot and we accept people and in our track record uh, for what we've done to members of the military who happen to be people of color is atrocious. Um, and I think it really challenges the belief that we have about ourselves. Um, and I also really understand this. We have to realize that in this case, we're actually colonizers. We're imperialists and we don't see ourselves as this is our like wait yeah. a minute this is our well, identity. The, the more you know education we have yes it starts to look that way yes yeah yeah but yeah. we bury that because i mean how do we have what makes us feel bad day in line <laughs> if we tell like oh by the way this is actually how we are yeah um so, and then for me personally, you know, to me, this is like ancestral healing. If we want to be better in the future, we have to start healing the past. It's all connected. Yeah. All right. So we can see you in New York next week or in a couple weeks. Uh, let's see. I want to talk about one i think that is related to a grant you got this is another seems like another way you you found a story or a story found you tell us about that okay yeah so um in the fall of 2023 i received a grant um from the insight fund which is through the andy warhol foundation for visual arts um it is more broad than just documentary, although it did include documentary. Basically, it's a, a grant that's like, hey, tell us what crazy thing you want to do with visual arts that you haven't done before. And I said, well, <laughs> I wrote this fantastic screenplay based on um, my 
indigenous heritage and uh, what is after- your indig- so I'm Lenape I'm Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania and they're Eastern Woodland Indians for people who are not familiar um, with the Lenape and so I wrote this epic it's set in like the middle of the 1500s and we are sinking ships and um, doing all kinds of really really fun things uh, me getting all of my existential angst out uh, in in a screenplay format um, through this part of my heritage. And uh, I got to the end of it and I'm like, well, you're going to need a hundred million for this one. Okay. A histor- I call it a historical fiction because okay. there is so much um, historical fact and accuracy. Um, but, you know, this is the story came out of a lot of my research um that kept showing that as explorers were coming to the new world um they kept taking children uh they kept taking children from tribes and um you know i had gone through a divorce and um i had a period of time where my children were not with me and i was deeply deeply affected by this so this was part of where i was really um exercising my my own pain um but also ancestral pain at how things went down um but again it was just too big i'm like you know it's my first feature narrative that i've written uh it's audacious and so um you know i kind of just kept kicking around what will i ever do with this um but when i was working on a long march with the illustrator we use for our animations um he's like hey um what else do you have that i can read that's your work and he loved it and i had yet another friend who's actually a mutual friend of yours and mine um chuck o'brien who read the script and he's like you know this would make a great graphic novel and i was like interesting interesting so I started working with the illustrator for my documentary to turn this into a graphic novel. And so here's, I pitched to the Insight Fund. I'm like, so let's have a conversation about how to move from screenplay to graphic novel to pub- public art or mural. Um, and I'm going to do a documentary about that whole process while we actually do the work. So um, we commenced in November. We had a public discussion um, at a movie theater. We brought in our tribal chief of education, um, Chief Adam DePaul. This is um, in Denver? In Denver, yeah. Um, My illustrator, Noni Cruzado. Um, Unfortunately, my cousin, Jason Botkin, who is an international mural artist, wasn't able to join us. So we brought in another mural artist from San Francisco, and we had this conversation about how we use art um, to reclaim our stories and um, to really level that playing field. And then we walk out into the lobby of the C Film Center where we're doing this, and we begin painting um, on mobile panels that uh, that's mural that is the opening scene of the film basically um and the mural itself is eight by 24 feet wow and i've never done that before i've never done that uh but now i have uh and we learned a lot of lessons uh <laughs> the process of what to do in the future what not to do um and uh, currently working with uh, a local Denver director, Marcus Essien, um, to finish uh, that documentary. That then we'll put it up in festivals and make it available. That one's public. That that one's you know out there for everybody as soon as we get that done. It's so complex. <laughs> I mean the, the 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 medium or the. I mean, I think it's awesome. I never, I can't imagine thinking of that. So it's a documentary about a graphic, turning a screenplay into a graphic novel, into a work of art. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I'm sure you see these similarities, but there's like two films you're working on are about giant pieces of art that are, and what did you, what was your quote? You just said something about 
art informing his or I don't know what it was, but you just said you said something brilliant. Everybody rewind. Well, well yeah. the the title of the actual panel uh, discussion um, is Nishinyit Ahas um, Art Canceling Erasure. Um, so Nishinyit Ahas and there will be great debate uh, amongst uh, the Lenape speakers in the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania as to how close I came to actually saying that. Um, <laughs> somehow I hear a grandmother being like, eh, good try. <laughs> but um, it's it's about, you know, the, all of these cultures have have met this point of not being allowed to tell their stories. and And that is a form of erasure. Um, so using art to penetrate back and in my illustrator, Noni, he's like, does this scene say enough? And I'm like, it's an entry point, you know, people can look at any point on this, you know, huge mural and see something that catches their eye and ask the question, what does that mean? And then they can dive down that part of it. Is it, um, this ethereal, uh, red bird who is part human that shows up on the left side of the mural who's kind of our guide through the story is it the village down below that they see it's like huh what are you know those aren't teepees what are those structures or is it the the crow over on the opposite side or are they what are they going to jump off at um as like their point to go into the story what other stories are on your mind that need to be told? Do you have anything you're working on? Yeah. You've so probably got in... ideas all the time. Like... Oh, yeah. Oh, they never stop. And I'm like, oh, quit it. Um, <laughs> but I am also uh, filming on a documentary with a local doc, uh, doctor. Um, I call him a healer. I've worked with him for 19 years. Um, and he works holistically with, um, the neurology of the body, um, and kind of the, the mind body connection to break up patterns that throw us into maladaptation. Uh, I almost said that word maladaptation, um, and help, you know, break up the patterns within whether they're emotional or physical so that we can live our fullest lives and our truest identities. Um, it is not something to unpack in a matter of minutes uh, on this conversation. Um, That's all we have, but we want to. Yeah, it's, but it's, it's a trip. Um, it's a trip. And, and you're working on anything else right now or is yeah, so I'm I'm like constantly working on the distribution and uh, continuing to push forward along March. Again, working on the Renegades um, episode. We'll be filming in March and April on that, and then going into post production. Uh, continue filming probably with Dr. Weisfeld here locally for I'm going to say another year. Um, and uh, oh yeah, I do have. Um, an unscripted that I'm working on uh, with my buddy Harry there in New Mexico. I'm not positive what I can say about this one. Um, you can come back and talk about it. Yeah, yeah, but we're really, really excited about that one. I'm actually meeting with some big wigs to talk about that one on Friday. So I'm hoping we see some really good movement. And uh, that one will be produced primarily out of New Mexico. So. That means cool. I'll be coming back. Great. Soon. Great. <laughs> it seems like it is. I know you work with teams and but you're kind of doing this as a one man, one person show like since well, for 10 years, but you're great. At, it seems like you're great at putting together the right people to. I do. I will say I have wonderful, wonderful support, um, you know, with a long march, a lot of the just distribution work that I'm doing. Um, I'm on it solo to a large degree because, you know, we were so underfunded. I am, I still owe a lot on deferments to my producers. My 
below the line are all paid off. Thank God. Um, but my producers, you know, they have to go make money. They're working on other projects. Um, but you know, if I ever like have to do that emergency call, they pick up, um, and we figure out what we have to, but I try not to torture them with the day-to-day minutia. Um, it's just not reasonable to even ask that. So, well, I really admire your ability to work alone and independently we'll say on these projects and get them done because that's something i personally as an independent contractor find challenging and i'm sure a lot of people do and i think it's just really cool to see that it's possible to 10 years ago not be really in the film world and to figure it out and pers- you know your persistence is amazing like what advice do you have for people who are thinking about getting into film or have an idea for a documentary? You know, it's hard work um, and you have to do the work. It is work, uh, but if you love it, it's less like work. <laughs> it's less like work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and you got to do it. Um, and I mean, early on the people who are like it's gonna cost twice as much as you think it's gonna take three times as long those people used to piss me off i am now that person (laughs) Uh, it will take probably more money than you expected um it'll take way longer than you thought you're gonna get curveballs but i will say um so far as long as i have figured out a way to bob and weave with it um, the results have been good. Um, in fact, like in the case of a long March, I mean, it was sad. It was heartbreaking as veterans were dying before we could even get the camera to them. And, you know, in my, in my mind, we were trying to get it done before all of these veterans were dead. Um, but you know, through all of that frustration and heartbreak, it forced us to just continue to pivot in different directions um and i think we made a better film in the end i think we did a better job so you just got to keep moving with it and if if you are faint of heart if you do not like uncertainty and if you do not like obstacles run do not (laughs) words of wisdom from tammy botkin joining us from denver colorado on her way to a producer's meeting wearing her director hat. Thanks for joining us. This is Castle Cersei, Santa Fe International Film Festival, and we will see you next week. Thanks for making time for us, Tammy.